Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, seminar called the Common Mental Health Issue uh, Seminar here. And uh, before I get started, I uh, just want to make sure that uh, if you would like this paper copy to hand out, I believe later on they'll be willing to send out electronic versions of that too. Now, the second disclaimer is that the handout that you have might be a little different than my projection here, just because um, I've been adding more slides onto you know the presentation. So I'm more apology up front, but uh, later on, if you find it helpful, we can distribute the PDF version of the same stuff here. And uh, before I get started, um, just do a little quick quick introduction uh, about myself. And uh, I work for Kaiser in Northern California, and I see average of about probably 300 patients a month. And that's a lot of patients you see, and I see probably all the mental uh, disorder there's out there under the sun. And I also do have a small private practice, but I don't see a lot of people uh, just because of lack of time. But uh, sometimes people get a laughter and get some hope just by knowing that they're coming to see me, because they kind of get assigned according to specialty. And some people say, oh, you're coming to see Dr. Phil today. He said, really? And then I said, no, he's got more hair and he's Asian. So usually that will just uh, put out all the hope, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, putting all the jokes aside, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, an issue that most of us would come across some point in a lifetime. But I want to do a quick survey real quick. Now, how many of you, how many of you here have dealt with yourself or someone you know that might have a mental disorder? How many people can I see a show of hands? Just about everybody. Astounding. That means that you're extremely honest and courageous. <laughs> I have good news for you, though, because that is most likely the case. Uh, one time my son told me, he said, you know, uh, you're the worst dad ever. And then, well, that got me a little depressed. And then second thing is that I don't know why people pay to come to see you. You gave the worst advice ever. <laughs> and, and then uh, when I told some people that didn't know me that I'm a clinical psychologist, they also say, well, you came from a mentally ill family, don't you? I said, yeah, that is so right. That's true. That's why I'm in this, this business. Now, the reason you're here, most likely because you dealt with a loved one or someone you care about that has mental disorder. And today, hopefully, that we can talk about some of the common mental disorder across ages, and then also give some normalization as well as uh, demystify something. In fact, for me to speak on this topic being an Asian is really tough because in Asian culture, we usually try to either keep a mental disorder under the carpet and we don't talk about it, or usually we blame the person who is having a mental illness. But I have incredible sympathy for people with mental illness just because my family have been played. Uh, when I was in college, my brother committed suicide, and uh, both my parents and then my sibling have mental disorder. And so I have incredible tolerance, patience, as well as compassion for people with mental disorder. Now, having said that, um, what makes something a mental disorder? Just the fact that somebody comes to you and say, I'm a little OCD, I'm a little paranoid, doesn't make a person have mental disorder. So we tend to say this, okay? Um, Mental illness is a condition that causes a person to be thinking, feeling, uh, behavior-wise, that deviate from the norm. But that's usually called the first D. Uh, now, the second D that we tend to use to classify mental disorder, it better carry some kind of dysfunction, meaning that the person is not able to get to work, the person is not able to take care of themselves, shower, eating, and whatnot. That's called dysfunction, right? And then also present another D, which is called danger. Usually people with mental disorder present some level of danger to themselves or to other people. And, and if, if a person just simply being a jerk, right, we don't usually call them have mental disorder because, you know, for example, Howard Hughes is a jerk. He's a kind of like deviant himself, but he doesn't show the other aspect until he discloses to people that he actually does have OCD. He has issue with cleanliness and afraid of germs, right? So. Uh, Having depression such as uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, um, it can be episodic, meaning that one occasion alone, or it can be a lifelong, lifelong illness. That's what we call mental illness. Affect one's ability to function on a daily basis and also being able to uh, relate to other people, whether it's loved one or, or close one. 
Now, just how exactly how common is mental disorder? According to CDC, um, one of the most common health condition is mental disorder. And about 50% of the men and women in this country in their lifetime will experience some sort of mental issue. For example, if I were to ask you, how many people had uh, flu before during any winter season? How many people remember having flu before? Do you remember? Can you, I see a show of hands. Uh, anybody ever had flu before oh. in their lifetime? Oh. Okay, now I can see more hands now. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you get flu? You, you, sick, you stay out from work, right? And having a mental disorder really, in a way, is not any different. It's mostly a medical issue in general. And when you're sick, you need to take rest and you need to get help. So any given time, about 20% of American in one year, let's say 2018, if I were to sample this group right here sitting in the front row, dividing from David onward, one of you would experience some kind of mental disorder. So I'm not going to tell you which one today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one in five children, about 20% of children, have experienced some kind of serious debilitating illness in their life. And one in 25 American experience the following serious illness, such as schizophrenia uh, disorder, bipolar disorder, or major depression. So you can see how common it is, right? If it's something so common, why do we need to hide that and put that in the closet? Well, might as well talk about it, think of it as a common problem, and then have it treated. OK, so today what I'm going to do is that I'm going to break down into three categories, mental illness in young children, the young adult, as well as in adult and then older adult, because out of three groups, you know, disorder tend to be different in each of the age groups. Um, when I say children, they tend to be from you know zero to eighteen year old, and then adult would be eighteen plus to sixty four and below, and also older adult sixty five and over. So, children disorder. If I were to ask you, um, you how many people here have kids? So a lot of you. And what kind of issue you tend to observe in kids? Define. Yeah. Not cooperating when you have to tell them to eat dinner and they go play video games and stuff like that, right? And what else? Anxiety. Anxiety? Okay. Anxiety a little more fear and anxiety, right? Yeah, children tend to feel a little less secure. They don't have resources to protect themselves. Naturally, they'll feel more insecure. What else? Autistic. Autism. This is something we're going to talk about real quick, okay? Just hold it up. And Very high -perk. Okay, ADHD. Okay, good. So, so, so far these two folks have talked about something that's close to my heart. And I'm going to talk about this real quick because in my family, uh, attention deficit is another issue that we have dealt with throughout, you know, our growing up. And I myself had had ADD when I was growing up too. So you probably couldn't tell just because the severity it was, but also having intervention myself and having insight into that. So now about 20% of the kids 18 and under have been through some kind of behavioral disorder, whether it's defined, opposition defined, or getting into legal trouble, stealing, and uh, doing uh, things that are against the law. And about, uh, usually, mental disorder in children will begin by 14 years old, which is interesting because that kind of hit the puberty period. So hormone has a lot to contribute to that. If hormone contributes to mental disorder, you better believe that it's mostly medical related, right? And 75% have had mental disorder by year 24. So if they pass the year 24 and they're independent, not living in you, amen, they're good. <laughs> okay, so the common disorder, uh, I'm going to speak primarily on the top one because some of the bottom will be shared by uh, adult and older adults, okay? Let's talk about ADHD and autism real quick. Um, what makes a person ADHD? So let me talk about children who have ADHD. Uh, if you f see kids that in school, they don't pay attention, tend to daydream and look at the window most of the time and draw an anime figure on the uh, you know, homework paper when they're supposed to be doing the homework and frequently lose things, lose the backpack, lose the cell phone, and making careless mistakes like writing ones and zeros, swapping numbers and 
letters and whatnot that tend to be assigned to ADHD, uh, always speaking out turn is when they're not allowed to talk, they talk over other people, or they tend to distract kids in school, and uh, they tend to be the one that call out. Now, ADHD tend to uh, be uh, what you call confused. Then let me demystify real quick. ADHD is a category we include the following. ADHD can be inattentive only, meaning the person cannot pay attention, doesn't have the resources to deal with organizing things, right? For example, uh, my daughter has ADD. When I walk into her room, half of her closet doors are always open. And that means that she always clean up her room. And then she never, she would leave like socks and underwear all over the floor. And, and I would be walking like into a minefield, right? So that's a sign of ADD. But she doesn't have what they call hyperactive disorder. Hyperactive disorder means someone always like uh, driven by a motor. They cannot stop, always fidgety, restless, and needing to put things in motion all the time. And uh, when you see some people at church, for example, right, tend to be a little annoying doing Sunday sermons, right? They're always like talking to the next door neighbors and passing out papers and sharing like sermon notes, and even though they're not supposed to, you know, they could have ADHD. <laughs> now, so these are the symptoms. Um, when we're back in 1977 onward to 2000, only about 3% of the kids are diagnosed. Guess what happened after 2003 to 2007? Look at the diagnosed uh, prevalence, almost doubled, become about 5%. Uh, so we ask the question, are kids getting more ADHD these days? What do you think? Not, not really. Uh, this gentleman say no, and this person say yes. So is it yes or no? <laughs> uh, you, you, you tell us. OK, uh, so here's the thing. Um, we have better diagnosis too these days. Right. Yeah, we can tell better if someone is inattentive only or it has hyperactive or both. So we have better diagnosis. The second thing is that our environment is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're giving cell phone to kids very early smartphone, and in fact, uh, instant gratification is one of the things that contribute to worsening of ADHD. Uh, so, as parents here or as people who plan to be parents. I would definitely encourage you to um, delay giving your kid smartphone until they are more mature, can handle things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that tends to be a highly debated topic, is what, at what age you give your, your kid a smartphone. Uh, my answer always is well, when they deem to be responsible and not keeping and not losing it. Like for example, my daughter, why I, I suspect she has ADD, she washed herself in three times in her gene until we start giving her a new phone. So anyway, uh, long story short, I'm sure a lot of you have lost cell phone in some way in the dryer and, and washers. Uh, is, that, is that clear enough to give you a sense of what ADHD looks like? Yes. Um, now, what caused ADHD? Uh, mostly genetic, uh, but somehow during the part of pregnancy and growing up, it can contribute to ADHD. For example, uh, some sort of brain injury during, uh, when they're younger or during pregnancy, mother expose themselves to some of that teratogen, for example, harmful chemicals such as smokes and alcohol and illegal drugs and whatnot. And my wife works in the neonatal intensive care um, unit in the hospital. She get a lot of kids who are born with defects and ADHD, partly because parents consume illegal drugs and they pass them directly to the kids. So premature delivery, low birth weight, these are all combinations that can contribute to ADHD. It's not one reason alone. I wish it was that simple. OK, and uh, you're welcome. And uh, just find your seat at MPC here. And there's also some handout. If you're extra, would you mind passing forward? Thank you. Um, so. Having said that, I'm not going to talk about treatment right now, but let me go into autism because autism seems to be on the rise. How many people here have dealt with kids with autism? Okay, let me just keep your hands up, please. Somehow, only on this side, this side is <laughs> I'm on the wrong side. You're on the wrong right side, yeah. Um, what do you notice about kids with autism? Can I just see it? You know, anybody? Anybody? No eye contact. Okay, what else? Social awkwardness. Social awkwardness, like me, or <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Social awkwardness. Cannot communicate. Cannot communicate. 
and then repeating things. Fidget. Repeating things. Okay, God, you guys are awesome because this is exactly what happened. People with autistic disorder, uh, they often do not look at people who have no eye contact. In fact, when we show picture of faces to people with autistic, autistic disorder, right? Kids would identify what? They identify the ear, the neck, uh, the chin. They never look at the eyes and the nose and the mouth, meaning that the social features, social cues they tend to miss. They only look at features that are non-social in nature. And, uh, okay. Okay, we're good. Now, what causes ASD or autistic uh, spectrum disorder? We don't really know. The, bad, the, the sad news is that, but we know that environmentally, biological, and genetic factors plays a part. For example, uh, kids with autism tend to come from family where parents does have some autistic issue. And we tend to see that, in fact, gender passing, meaning that if mother has autistic features and just some trait, the son is at risk. And guess what? Unfortunately, boy and males have tend to be more susceptible to ASD than women. And for whatever reason that is, uh, we don't know. Uh, just like depression, for example, depression hit women harder uh, women than men. Uh, environmentally, we study siblings with ASD tend to be biological twin, would have very high prevalence of uh, ASD. Uh, uh, chromosomal conditions such as fragile X syndromes and uh, some other illnesses can cause that. And pregnancy, during pregnancy, uh, before pregnancy, during and immediate after birth exposure to uh, these uh, the pride and uh, the McDonald's, and these chemicals tend to cause high risk of ASD. Also, children from older parents tend to have higher order of ASD. But again, it's not one thing alone, it tend to be a multiple issue causes ASD. Now, yes, that's a question. Also, I have a quick question. Sibling with ASD applies to um, identical or, or fraternal? Usually identical. Okay. Usually identical. And sometimes you have the non-identical twins, right? You mm -hmm. could have a boy and a girl. Yeah. And the girls are tend to be more protective than the, girl, the boys. Thank you. Okay. Okay, what is the prevalence of ASD? Um, it was 0.66% in the prior estimate, but up to about 2014, it jumped to about 1.7. So if I were to sample an audience here, approximately what we have about 40 people in this room, uh, that means possibly half of a person here might have ASD. That's the prevalence. Uh, for parents, uh, what do you do, right? What do you do? If you find a kid still continuing muted after about two year old, there's a strong signs of autism. Uh, kids tend to be playing alone, not social, doing repetitive action, always like very fixated on doing one thing alone over and over again. That's a sign of autism. You should have the child talk to uh, your primary doctor, have them to be professionally assessed. Uh, what we find is that, um, why we call autistic spectrum disorder because Autism is a range of low functioning to high functioning. That's why it's called spectrum. We find that an early intervention there is the likelihood that the kid can be functional to be a functional adult is higher. Um, the good news is that even though the problems seem to go higher, partly because we have better diagnosis tool these days, and secondly is that we have better intervention these days. I've seen kids who are muted uh, up to three year old, and when they get early, you know, vocational training and speech training, they start developing proper speech, and in fact, they can function in life and work almost, almost to the degree of a functional adult. So that's the good news. Um, any questions? Any comments? Okay, so I'm going to go real quick now. So we cover ADHD and ASD. Now we're going to talk about common disorder in adult. What are the common adult uh, disorder? We tend to find clinical depression, general anxiety disorder, and specific anxiety disorder tend to be the most common. And what do we mean by that? Well, how many people here were at the previous seminar where we talked about depression and suicide? Okay, a good number of you. Hopefully this will be too depressed, I mean, too uh, laborious to you because we already talked about it. 
Now, the fact that somebody tells you that I'm a little depressed, I'm a little sad, doesn't mean the person is clinically de have clinical depression. It has to not just feeling down momentarily. It has to affect a person's daily functioning, how they relate to the people. We classify according to the CDC, uh, CDC ICD-10, 11 criteria, DSM-5 criteria, that you have to have at least five or more symptoms and persist over two weeks in order to be classified clinical depression. So don't worry, somebody comes in, I'm, I'm a little depressed, so you would tell them, oh, no, you're only depressed for three days, it's not clinically depressed, that's good news. And symptoms such as feeling depressed, sad, and teary, uh, constant fatigue, even after you have slept for 24 hours, still feeling really tired, uh, sleep disturbance, eating too much or eating very little, not feel like eating at all, losing weight, feeling guilty, memory concentration issue. In the severe cases, self-isolation, suicidal thoughts, and self-harm, cutting themselves or doing things, engaging in risky behavior. Now that we have talked about depression, and uh, um, I want to stay here for a moment. I know that uh, this is going so quickly, and uh, if, if uh, I, I really sympathetic for you folks, because you've only been given 15 minutes. I'm giving just like two hour worth of material in 15 minutes. Uh, is there any question, any elaboration that's needed? Or are you already feeling a little depressed? <laughs> <laughs> or anxious. Or anxious, there we go, okay. Um, Okay, what is uh, anxiety disorder? Uh, there's a class of uh, anxiety disorder called the, the GAD, general anxiety disorder. Someone that tend to be worrying a lot and worry to the degree of out, out proportion. For example, I have an elderly patient who came in who uh, constantly mopping, uh, wiping her table, very anxious. And I would ask her, what are you anxious about? You know, you're retired and you know, your children are doing well, they all have jobs, you have a place to live. She said, you know, I'm worried that my social security will not be enough for me to live the rest of my life. Well, you know what? When I look at her income, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> she has more than enough to pay her rent, her food, her food stamp and all that. In fact, her children always subsidize every month, giving her some income. So this is what we meant by worrying out proportion because it's not a reality. So people tend to worry about the sky will fall or a meteorite will stri strike from the west. A s perceiving threat, they're not feeling safe, even though there's no threat. For example, always like installing security camera all over the place, including a bathroom, even though there's ne never been a break-in in their life. Uh, over plan things to all possible outcomes, thinking that everything will turn into you know, the worst possible scenario. Do not have, pro have problem handling uncertainty, for example, you know, should I be taking uh, the subway, or should I be taking the bar, or should I be flying? What should I do? You know, there's so many choices. I have a lady who have this general anxiety disorder. She was sitting on her desk for two hours, just trying to find the right word to say in that little email. She sat there moaning over, and that's general, generalized anxiety disorder. She cannot decide for herself. Uh, indecisiveness, fear of making the wrong decision, unable to relax, feeling restless, uh, have trouble concentrating to the point that they go blank. Okay, uh, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but you don't have to, don't worry, I won't quiz you and test you about these symptoms, but uh, it gives you a sense of flavor what generalized anxiety is or the order is about. Um, now, this is a serious problem, why? The fact that someone who is just simply restless and cannot decide actually doesn't cause major dysfunction other than being slow and not able to perform 100%. But a lot of times, they turn into worsening medical condition. For example, a lot of irritable bowel syndrome that we, uh, some of you heard, IBS, right? It's directly cause of stress and anxiety. And headache, for example. Uh, chronic pain can be worsened, uh, sleep and insomnia and worsening of diabetes and uh, heart problem, hypertension, all that, that can be contributed by anxiety. All right, so um, I want to pause for a moment. Uh, am I going too fast or is it okay? Okay, let me talk about specific anxiety now. Now, specific anxiety is different than general anxiety in the following way, because it has very, very specific symptoms. 
when a person has uncontrolled overwhelm anxiety, it can lead to panic attack. Uh, how many people here have heard of panic attack or experienced panic attack? Oh, a lot of you I do. Have, I have an experience, but my mother has. Your mother has. Uh, what do you see in her? She goes in a panic mode and she uh, just feels like she's going to die and uh, just pain and right, it feels like a heart attack. Yes, like it? a heart attack. Now, uh, at Kaiser, every year we receive a lot of emergency room patients come in for heart attack. Turns out, it's all because of panic attack. They have severe palpitation in the heart where the trigger point and the heart pounds so much that yes. heart can literally jump out of the body. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're about dying and cannot breathe. And somebody's choking the neck and to the point that they're suffocating. Yes. And that's panic attack. And sometimes you heard people say the term anxiety attack. It's the same thing, panic attack. And that, uh, the good thing about panic attack is that it's only a psychological problem. It's actually not so much a medical issue. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, now, the lady that I talked about before, the elderly lady who mopped her table two hours a day or more, uh, she, from her generalized anxiety, it started to develop into a specific form of obsessive thought and compulsive behavior, meaning that some kind of thought just would not go away. So the thought that would not go away for her is that I'm running out of money, I'm going to be homeless, uh, I'm going to be losing my house. And she keep dwelling on that. And now she start developing some compulsion. I need to control my anxiety. One thing that she could do, she knows how to do, is to mop her dinner table really well. Guess what? She starts mopping a table for five minutes from end to end, and all of a sudden, a sun ray comes down, a, p a few dust particles fell on the other side of the table. She starts wiping the left side of the table. After she does that, guess what happened? More dust particles fell on the right side. She goes to the right side. Now she starts mopping that until the point that she's so exhausted she can't look at the table anymore. She all of a sudden she notices that, oh, look at the door handle. Somebody touched that. There must be germ on it. She starts wiping, spending the next half an hour wiping the window. And then guess what? She's late for worship every time. And sometimes she only catches the worship during the benediction cycle. That she was hoping the pastor would say something about curing OCD, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's OCD. Uh, so just to map the fact that somebody tells you, I'm a little OCD, doesn't mean the person is OCD. It has to have the persistent, unshakable thought and then compulsive action in order to cause OCD. Another type of specific uh, anxiety is called social anxiety, meaning that people have trouble speaking in the public. Now, the fact that I'm standing here talking to you, most likely I don't have social anxiety because I am able to stand in front of you reasonably comfortably, uh, look at everyone's you know, facial features. But for few people who have social anxiety, there was fear of embarrassment and standing in front of people doing presentation, speaking in front of a group, fear of embarrassment. And that is more common than you think. I have a young uh, college student that came to me, and he said every time he sit in the class, his heart started to rave because he was afraid that the professor might be calling out on him and asking him to introduce himself. You know, how embarrassing can that be, right? But usually most of us wouldn't have trouble deal with that. But for some reason, when anxiety starts to pile up, and it can cause specific anxiety. And those are the most common form of um, disorder. And specific phobia, fear of a particular object, unable to drive across a bridge, afraid of reptile, afraid of uh, dogs or cats or height, vertical. Those are specific anxiety. The good thing, though, is that everything that we talk about so far they are very treatable with a combination of psychotherapy or maybe some need of medication. Uh, so the hope is that they are cured. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the older adult now. Um, yes, that's a question in the back. Yeah, so going back on the uh, social anxiety um, uh, the disorder, what would, the, what would be the difference of that compared to having like an What's the difference between that? Now, being an introverted person gives you a little bit more vulnerability towards social anxiety. Now, the difference is that the social anxiety causes per person some kind of uh, this, uh, what you call debilitation, mm -hmm. meaning that he or she is so afraid of that social contact that he would not go into the play. 
For introverted person, you might just simply walk into the room, sit in a quiet corner, choose not to say a whole lot, but when teacher calls your name, you can, okay, I'm John Doe, right? And that's the difference. Yes? Um, recently, I, uh, I have, I met a, a friend, and not very, not very close, but somebody introduced him, and they say he has Asperger. Have you heard about Asperger? Yes. Okay. So okay. what is that compared to the autism spectrum autism. disorder? Okay, good question. Remember, we talked about ASD being a spectrum, right? From very high severity to mild severity. Asperger is usually what we call a high function in autism, meaning that the person can interact to a certain degree with certain kind of social awkwardness, but he or she can still function at the job and being able to earn a living and living independently. That's what we call Asperger mm -hmm. spectrum disorder. Okay. All right, so re we ready for the older adult? Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, somebody asked re er early on, uh, what are some of the specific disorders for uh, elderly population? Here's what I want to say. Let's take a 10,000 feet picture aerial view of our whole world is getting older. Just the fact that you're sitting here, you are the post-World War II generation. We've gone through a baby boom phase where a lot of baby boom are now aging. And in the United States, in Japan, in China, older population is a bigger part of the pie. That's the reason why Medicare now is having a hard time because we have a large population of older folks retiring. But guess what? Younger people are fewer. Families are smaller. We have fewer children to support that social security system. So most likely that your children will be taxed at a high rate to support the retired population. So uh, now, in the United States and across the world, older population will increase approximately 12% to 22%. In other words, out of five people here or more, one of the person is reaching a retirement age. Now, with the older population, we tend to see some form of mental illness or neurological disorder, such as Parkinson's disorder, dementia, and various things. About 15% of 60 people and over tend to suffer from some kind of mental disorder. And 15% is about one out of eight people. Okay, so. Mm. Sorry, uh, this, this one uh, originally I was given in Mandarin, and that's why I have dual language on it. Now, for elderly uh, people, these are the common issues that you dealt with. Mild cognitive decline, meaning memory and concentration not as good as before. Sleeping disorder, because we don't sleep as well as before. We, we tend to sleep later and sleeping less. Doesn't mean that we need less sleep, just that your ability to generate melatonin and being able to fall asleep faster is not as good. Anxiety, depression, substance abuse, dementia, and psychosomatic issue. Out of that, I want to concentrate today a little bit more on dementia, just because we see so much of that. Uh, how many people here is afraid that they may have dementia? Go ahead and raise, read it, please. raise your hand. Uh, won't stigmatize you. Actually, a good number of people. Well, I have good news for you. Most people who are fearful of having dementia, they most likely do not have dementia. <laughs> now, another good news is that most people who have dementia do not remember them having dementia. <laughs> yes? But isn't it genetic? Like, um, like my mom had it. Yes, so, okay. She passed away early because. Okay, let's speak to that a little bit, okay? Uh, is uh, dementia something that is genetic? Uh, now, I want to demystify that some more. <coughs> dementia tend to be um, confused among 80 different kinds of illness. Underneath the umbrella of dementia, we have about 80 different types. But most prevalent is Alzheimer, as many of you know. That occupies about 80% of the uh, dementia. The other 15% come from what we call vascular dementia, meaning stroke. Uh, those of you who have hypertension are at risk of having vascular dementia, meaning that some part of your brain all of a sudden have a blood vein that has burst or been clogged up, and the receiving cell die of that as a result, and it causes very specific function. Uh, just a, about a year and a half ago, my mother-in-law suffered from a major uh, stroke. All of a sudden, she was wearing her pajama, 
and then she's ready to walk out her apartment into the street. Uh, she lives in Hong Kong in these high rises, right? People don't wear pajama into the street. In fact, they have these gate, metal gate door that requires someone to unlock it. She was trying to rush out the door, and then she was stuck talking gibberish, not in tongues, you know? And no one could understand what she was saying. And then afterwards, she had a series of stroke afterward. And that's what is called vascular dementia. And we'll speak a little bit more to that. So I just want to you to be aware of some of the common disorder that among the elderly that are unique. Can I ask a quick question, sir? Yes, sir. Can you just real brief uh, talk about the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And so dementia okay. is like the umbrella? Yes. Yeah, and then Alzheimer's is, is a subset of? Exactly, of subset exactly. Of so underneath the umbrella of dementia, there are 80 <laughs> different type of plus of uh, what it calls illnesses can be Parkinsonian, Alzheimer, Parkinsonian disorder, whatnot. Now, 80% of that is Alzheimer. And Alzheimer, we'll speak more on that. Let me postpone on that, because that's the majority of uh, the, the uh, elderly uh, issue dealt with. The other type is called vascular dementia. It's really kind of a stroke. And that stroke will cause very specific <coughs> dysfunction in yourself. Either, let's say, have your body become paralyzed and unable to speak, unable to remember. Uh, in fact, uh, vascular dementia can be very interesting. There was a patient who always been a good citizen, always mild manner good person, kind of heart. After he has the vascular dementia, he actually starts speaking the F word at church. Oh. So that very scary. Uh, yes, that's a question. How does it connect with senility? How does that connect with senility? Yeah, just uh, the difference between dementia and senility, is that a spectrum, or is senility one within the umbrella, or is senility just normal aging? Well, senility, we tend to use that as normal aging. So normal aging, forgetfulness, mm -hmm. different things. Exactly. But, uh, Alzheimer and vascular dementia are not normal aging. I, I hope that gives some clarification. But we'll speak uh, more detail about that in a second, okay? Um, okay, dementia. These are the kind of symptoms that you see. First thing people notice is memory decline, thinking ability to perform daily tasks, unable to recognize loved one, uh, but these are not the normal aging, they are not, they are not normal senility. The estimate is that currently about 50 million people uh, suffer from dementia. 60% of them are low to median income. For some reason, uh, rich people seem to be better shielded, so get rich fast. <laughs> and the projection is, that, projection is that more and more people will suffer from dementia. Let me ask you why. You can, can you think of any reason more and more people will suffer with dementia? Living longer. They're living longer. Living longer, we have higher longevity. Mm -hmm. Think about your parents, right? If your parents live to the 60s, 70s, now people easily live to, to the 90s now. Yeah. Guess what? Probably most of you folks here will live beyond 100. Share a thought, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so dementia <laughs> is an illness we call your body outlives your brain. Make sense? So. A brain doesn't really necessarily age at the same pace your bodily function. Uh, so one form of uh, Alzheimer that we're most fearful of is that when you have an Alzheimer brain, but you have a well-functioned body, it's the most risky kind because they tend to get themselves lost, get themselves injured, and vice versa. Now, uh, beyond, uh, beyond longevity, another risk factor is that as modern people, we tend to overnourish ourselves with unhealthy food. Um, there was a saying from my uh, uh, parent in laws generation, um, they only get to eat chicken once a year during the Cultural Revolution period where uh, commodity and materialistic things are in short supply. Well, can you imagine eating a nugget once a year? <laughs> but now we eat it almost on a weekly basis, right? We eat meat all the time. But the fact that we overnourish our, our body actually produce a lot of harm. So now it's the time that we need to think carefully about our daily life habit as well as diet and vice versa. Okay, um, dementia intervention. Um, I just want to pause a second. Did I keep enough, uh, talk enough about the symptom of dementia? So I didn't put that on slide. So I, I want to again point out the two major differences that Alzheimer is a progressive, gradual deterioration of dementia, whereas vascular dementia onset is very sudden. 
and could happen overnight. At the same time, vessel dementia can have what we call staircase of deterioration, meaning that one day they might not be able to speak, the next day on top of another to speak, they might forget about what the use of toothpaste and toothbrushes. Like my, my mother-in-law, she was standing in front of the sink one day. She was doing just fine. She wasn't able to speak clearly, but she was doing everything fine. One day she was holding a toothbrush and she was on said, what's this? What am I supposed to do with this? She lost her cognitive function differentiating objects and how to do things. Mm -hmm. question on dementia. Yes. Is it considered a terminal disease? Yes. Dementia, at this point, there's no cure. Uh, it's irreversible. Uh, since we talk about that, then we need to think about how to deal with that. Um, early dementia, early Alzheimer, some form of medication would be helpful. The Nocepin and various kind of dementia uh, medication can bring a sense of clarity and slowing down the illness itself. But when people reach the middle and the later stage of dementia, it's irreversible. And this is where the time we recommend uh, patient family members to brace themselves for the storm. And also, if you deal with elderly folks, your caregiver, please, please do not take care of the uh, dementia patient alone, thinking that you are the loved one, you are the sole responsible caregiver. Always, always go in as a team, finding more resources to help yourself. It's the best way to go about caring for elderly with dementia. Avoid burnout. Burnout, right? Burnout is a very common phenomenon. You don't know at Kaiser how many people come in as caregiver dementia that are burned out, that needed our help. Is that, uh, is that clear? Great. Now, uh, we talk about intervention, right? Now, really, because dementia is not irreversible, the only thing that you can do is try to give enough support to improve the quality of life, as well as improving the quality of life for the caregivers themselves. Because when the caregiver themselves in good shape, they can better take care of the patients themselves. When the patient caregiver are burned out, not only that they cannot care for the patient, they cannot care for themselves, they themselves become risky. Fair enough. So again, if you walk away today, remember that caring about elderly patients is that don't ever go in alone. Always go in as a team, gathering resources in the community to help. And uh, we talk about intervention, early diagnosis, promoting early optimal uh, uh, management, uh, optimizing physical, mental health, and well-being, uh, finding appropriate treatment, and we ourselves need to be better educated and providing long-term care support to caregiver themselves. Yes? Is there an early diagnosis method for Alzheimer's? Yes, there is. Uh, so very good question. Let me speak to that. Now, in the old day, let's say about two decades ago, the only way you can definitely diagnose someone with Alzheimer's is what? You have to wait until the person dies. You have to do a brain biopsy to extract these protein plaque to definitely confirm they have uh, dementia. However, that's usually too late. It's not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, uh, I believe Eli uh, Lilly, a pharmaceutical company, they invent a method where they inject a colored dye into your brain. It's uh, soluble. It attaches to these protein plate, which are hallmark feature of these biomarkers, and they would show up, and they, when they do the CT scan, right, they can detect early signs of Alzheimer's. So if you suspected that, let's say, your parents have Alzheimer's, and you're afraid that you might be susceptible to that, uh, that's a procedure you can inquire into. Uh, I forgot exactly the name of the procedure I can look up, but it's by, by Eli, uh, Eli Lilly. And it's uh, some form of radioactive injection that you can detect early Alzheimer's. Is that, is that uh, yeah. yeah. But now, some people don't like these you know, radioactive right. injectable yeah. dye, right? But they tend to be, be very low dosage and um, can highlight in the brain where you can definitely detect a differential yes. biomarker. Yes? What can you do in early life to reduce? Okay, what can you do with early life dementia, and especially mm -hmm. Alzheimer? In fact, there are helpful things that you can do. One of the most helpful things we found is, with, is life habit. What do we mean by that? Uh, if you know, someone always been sleeping late and have chronic sleep deprivation, that would subject you to more high risk of dementia. 
And therefore, the right thing to do is to start changing the habit. The internet is doing us a disfavor. Internet's available 24 seven. Guess what, when you are not able to go to sleep, the first thing you tend to do is take out your cell phones, check some social media messages, and then go online, because you may be data secure. In fact, that actually pushes out even further into susceptibility for dementia. And eating healthy food, for example, eating balanced diet, such a balance of food, reducing red meat as you age in 45. For example, I used to be a Pepsi lover. I usually drink about three, two to three cans of Pepsi in my 30. When I detected I have some signs of you know, high glucose and cholesterol, you know what, I stopped cutting out and I started exercising and all that. Guess what, when I'm into my 50s, my vital signs and all my um, blood test results were better than my, in my 40s. And I think I'm doing better today than I was when I was 30. So that's the good news is that what can you do? Uh, keep yourself active in a community, uh, keep consistent physical exercises, get into a balanced, healthy diet. Uh, those are the protective factors for yourself. And do pay attention to your annual checkup. If any of your vital signs and anything that's a little off the chart, do pay attention and do not just say, okay, it might get better next year. Guess what? It doesn't get better next year. It likely get worse next year. The, the thing to do is to engage in proactive management of your lifestyle. Is it, is it, uh, is it fair? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yes. I'm gonna add something. Uh, does uh, stress and depression have any, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Alzheimer's have anything to do? Is there any correlation between stress? Does Alzheimer have anything relating to stress? Normally, no. Uh, what we found was that Alzheimer tend to be a biological hereditary symptom. Now, it could also be because of chronic lifestyle. Chronic lifestyle of stress can contribute to signs of uh, dementia. Now, um, people who are uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer, a lot of them here was that a lot of them tend to develop depression into mid or late stage of their Alzheimer just because they notice that there are a lot of things they used to be able to do, they no longer can do. Things that they enjoy doing like rock climbing, hiking, traveling, they cannot do. When you're feeling helpless, you're gonna start feeling depressed. What, 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 oh, sorry, I'm gonna give an opportunity to oh, do. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, under your helpful summary for prevention tips, you mentioned socialization. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, what do you mean by socialization? Uh, if you look at this little diagram here, we are a creature of spiritual, emotional, physical, academic, social, environmental, financial being. We are consist of interaction, all those factors. Guess what? We find with a latest uh, large-scale study, what makes people healthy is not simply because you eat well, you exercise well, turns out that socialization is a big protective factor for people to live well. And a lot of people with uh, mental health disorder, for example, schizophrenic, you know, it's very severe mental disorder, they do much better in a communal setting than they would do in the United States and country where there's a lot of personal isolation. In the United States, unfortunately though, one thing that doesn't really do us favor, it's the continual isolation where kids are exposed to a high degree of autonomy. And in, in psychology, we find a uh, phenomenon called social referencing, is that when kids, uh, they meet a stranger, they don't know what to do. They don't know this, this stranger should be trusted or should run away from. The first thing they do is that they look at the parent to see how their parents react. Right? And that's called social referencing because they want to see how parents react. If the parents are smiling, it means that this person is not a threat. <laughs> if the parents start fr frowning and then start making you know, neurotic faces, guess what? The kids will follow the same way. Now, this social referencing phenomenon continues on into our adult life. Guess what? Uh, schizophrenic, for example, if you keep them in isolation, they have no point of reference what they should do. They start to act out according to how they feel. Same thing with all of us here. When we in a community where people are healthy, that are loving and compassionate, that has an effect on a mentally disordered person, doesn't it? And the fact that they see a community that's truly caring and honest and compassionate, they would be affected similarly. So that's the reason that uh, God put us in a spiritual community that are honest and courageous, that are not afraid of speaking about mental health illness, 
we're here for each other because we all been there before. So that's the degree of socialization I was talking about. Uh, it's not coming to a community where we all act superficially. Every morning, hello, how are you? I'm just fine. Well, the reality is that every one of us has some turbulences in our life, and uh, it's okay to say, you know, today I'm not feeling so well. I felt like I just fell off the back of a truck, and that's okay, too. Okay, so I think my time is up. Um, I don't think I have any more time, but I just want to give you one walk away because we started about five minutes late. Uh, let me just speak to that. Um, a lady created a sign called Energy. And later on, guess what? I didn't know where it came from. The author, one day while speaking at a seminar, she came up to me and said, you know what, I created that phrase, energy. And let me give you this gift of energy from Dr. Susan Liu. She was a nutritionist, I believe. And what is energy? Energy means the following. E-N stands for eat nutritiously. And E-R means exercise regularly. And then G-Y means grow wisely. So if there's a gift for me to give you um, before we part is to think about energies, how to live wisely. And um, I'm going to consult the uh, organizer of this event if I can give you the uh, PDF. I know this is not in your slide. But everything that we talk about today is very much consistent with the scriptural teaching of how to live a content, a life in gratitude, a life that's filled of you know, community support with compassion and hope. So uh, I'm going to end here today, and uh, I just want to see if there's any parting question and I have not uh, answered. I just want to add something. Uh, I read a lot about, you know, a lot of the over-the-counter stuff, medications, you know, sleep days, uh, even some of the stuff that's prescribed like, like lorazepam or Ativan, a lot of stuff has just been linked to Alzheimer's and linked to dementia. So it's something that I think a lot of people are not aware. Okay, uh, let, let me say the category, okay? Um, most of the psychiatric medication are synthetic compounds. And synthetic compound, its own function is to mimic our natural body's function. For example, depression. With antidepressant, the purpose is to boost up the serotonin and orphan. Uh, artificially. But guess what? If you do these healthy things, the energy that we talked about, it's a natural way for you to restore your body's homeostasis function. And medication tend to be what we call masking the symptom or artificially temporarily boosting the function. The best way is to restore your life in a healthy uh, manner naturally. And that will be the way to go on a holistic basis, on a long-term basis. Okay, thank you so much.